Gab, the show for working musicians, episode 408 for Monday, December 18th, 2023. Folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the show by, for, and about working musicians. Here, as usual, in Durham, New Hampshire, I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Capitola, California, Paul Ken. I'm going to miss hearing that every week, Paul. Well, it, it'll, it'll, I guess we're going to try and make it occur at irregular oh, intervals. But oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It, it will, it will occur at regular intervals. I'm glad, I'm glad for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So. This is our this is our final episode of the year, right? We're not doing one together next week. We're we're taking Christmas yep. off and like this is it. Okay. I just want to make sure. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah. 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 I um I'm prepping for those gigs next week. The uh the well there there's two Rocky Horrors bookending the gig, the week, one on Christmas night and one on New Year's night. And then in the middle are five headwig gigs. Rocky I just did. I don't I'm not gonna would shed that like that that's fine. But I hadn't, I realized I hadn't played Hedwig in over three years. It seemed like we were doing that so regularly that it was just like, Oh yeah, it's whatever. And then I was like, wait, the last one was September of 2020. Like, huh? Okay. <laughs> and I started playing. I, I was like, well, I, I, I should, you know, re I should play this show, you know, on my own here, fumble through the things that I'm going to have forgotten or whatever. And we have a recording of, one of the earlier runs that we did and my, my friend Ken, who's our guitar player in the Hedwig band, he took the, the stems of one night of the show and mixed down the songs. So I've been playing along with that so that I have our arrangements and all of that stuff. It's really bizarre because I'm playing along with me and there's lots of this that I don't remember. I mean, like in general, I remember the songs, but like there's a lot of nuances that are like, huh? I, like I know that that's me playing that part, and I have no memory of that little nuance or this little nuance. Mm. <laughs> it's weird. It's and it's it is weird playing along with me because I have no memory of it, and yet there are times where I'll play the same fill as the guy on the record, even though I don't know what he's about to play because it was me. Um, but it's yeah, it's been it, it's it's been a little humbling. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it just comes from a, a deep place, right? It just comes from not muscle memory, but just kind of like, you know, psyche. It just kind of yeah, comes out from there. It comes from there. Exactly. Yeah. It's bizarre. So it's, yeah, pra practicing with myself, but but not a, not a me that I remember fully. So, yeah. It's kind of what a producer does, right? Like when you go in and record stuff, a producer hears some little thing that is of use and and we'll extract it out either through a mix or, you know, a rearrangement or something like that. It's those little things that are, are serendipitous. that is often where the magic occurs, right? The little hook, the little, the little, you know, push to time or, 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 uh, you know, emphasis to a beat or something like that. Emphasis to a vocal. It can change a whole song. I totally agreed. Yeah. I, I've always thought I, when I'm producing people, which I don't do very often, but I do sometimes. And certainly when I am being produced, I look to the producer to find moments or events, right? Like those things. And and there's other things too, like the really just being a coach sometimes in the studio and a good engineer, that, like the lines are often blurred uh, between, you know, engineer and producer sometimes, not always, but, uh, you know, that, that coach of like, okay, yeah, you did, you did that take was good. Let's do it again. You know? Um, yeah, that was good. And they'll, a good producer I will find will often in those scenarios, highlight the positives of a, of a performance. And unless you're making the same mistake over and over again, they'll ignore any of the negatives. Like if a vocal went out of tune at one point, they'll be like, Oh yeah, your pitch here was fantastic. And this, that, and the other thing, just, now that you're warm into it, sing it again, you know, and they're just looking to build you up and get that best performance out of you. So, so it, it's a lot, but that's, that's often the engineer 
if if there is a split between engineer and producer, I, I often get the coaching from the engineer. Whereas, like you said, the producer is looking for those little events or moments. Yeah, I have this friend Tom Duell. Yeah, he is a great musician, but he's also a great producer. But he's a great I don't, I don't know what the right word. I mean, he's producing you, but he works with you as a vocalist. And literally, he if you're going fine, great. If he needs to break it down to have you sing things line by line, where you need to enunciate, where you need to breathe, all these types of things, he gets great, great performances out of people. That's great. I always like that whenever I'm, it's vocals that I, if I produce stuff, it's often vocals because I have a decent setup here to record vocals. I get that good warm mic. Uh, it is a warm sounding microphone, but it's also a warm audio mic, the, the clone of that Telefunken. And, you know, I got a decent setup to record here. And so it's, it's vocals. I, yeah, it, it's, it's a trick getting people to just kind of let go, but not too much. Right. You know, cause you don't, yeah. you, you, what happens live is often great energy. But if you were to listen back to tracks, a lot of times it's like, well, it worked in the room. Like it's fine, but you wouldn't want to put that out necessarily, you know? And, uh, so it's, it's getting those, finding that balance. That's yeah. That's a skill. I I'm, I'm okay at it. I've worked with people like, like your friend, Tom, who are masters at it. And it's like, oh man. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, there's that new, um, book. I actually have it as an audio book that Rick Rubin did called the creative act that talks just about, it's really about creativity in general. It's super interesting because I didn't know how little of a musician Rick Rubin is. Right. I mean, he, he's not a musician, right? Oh, no. And, and he, he's literally a, a super intuitive set of ears is what his whole amazing career has been. Yep. I mean, Beastie Boys to Tom Petty to all the, you know, hip hop records. I mean, Red Hot Chili Peppers he's pretty, and, and everything yeah. in between. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And again, he's not a musician and he's literally just a intuitive psychologist intuitive observer of, of what people in the market, like, although, although the most interesting thing for me is his most emphatic thing about creating art is you never create art for other people. It does, just doesn't ring true. Mm. You have to create art that, that rings true for you. And then you let the universe take care of whatever it is. It's, it's really fascinating. Like I said, I have it on an audio book and it's a, it's a really interesting listen. It's, it gets a little, Est e, you know, it gets a little, you know, uh, holy, uh, uh, what is it? Heady. Heady is, is kind. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but, but it's a good listen. Yeah. I mean, he knows what he's done in his career and I, he definitely, you know, he has some layer of humility to it and some layer of supreme cockiness as to yep. you know how good he is at, at what he does. And when he leans into the cockiness, it's, it's a little, you know, it's a little self-serving, but yeah, but there are a lot of good lessons about creativity in it. The yeah. creative act. I okay. I'll put a I put a link in the show notes to that uh, at giggabpodcast.com. I uh I have enjoyed the episodes of Broken Record that uh, I listened to with him. He's no longer with that show, but um did you listen to any of those episodes of, of Broken Record that that Rick Rubin that's, that's I I I'm trying to remember. I think he did do one with Springsteen. He did. That, that was, yep. That it was, was him and, and who, yeah. who was, who was his co-host on that? Well, he and Malcolm Gladwell often, t- often tag teamed, right? I mean, they, they, like one would do an episode or the other would do an episode. I believe the one with Springsteen was one of the rare occasions where you got both of them with yeah. the artist. Yeah. Cause they were both such huge fans and, and wanted to yeah. kind of be there. I loved that interview with Springsteen. I, that I, I've never, I, I don't dislike Springsteen. I, I like some of his songs. I've never prior to listening to that episode. I was never like, I never understood Springsteen. Maybe that's the right way to, to approach it. Uh, and listening to that, it was like, Oh, okay. I, I, I see who this guy is, or at least a glimpse into who this guy is here. Yeah. I like that episode a lot. Actually. I wouldn't say that, and then you add in the Howard Stern interview, which was awesome. I didn't, I didn't I, check the, that out. Okay. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. And that, you know, that's, that's within the last year. Yeah. And then I actually think the Broadway show is kind of awesome because it's very autobiographical. autobiographical. Yeah. So you can see that on Netflix. You can see the, the Howard Stern interview, I think on HBO. 
And then um, the, this podcast, the Ruben podcast, that's still just out there in the world, yeah. right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's still out there. Yeah. I, I listened to it in the last six months, and I think it was, you know, certainly more than a year old, if not years old at the time. But, yeah. Yeah. It, the thing he did with with uh, with McCartney was really that little three or four piece oh my thing that he did on Netflix. That oh. that was and he was like he was a total fanboy in that. Right. He was he was in awe of McCartney and it was a great conversation. It, it you know, I, I agree with everything you just said. Rick was in awe and just like a little kid there getting to be there while Paul experienced this music, you know, with, with him. But. What I also really liked about that was how much of a Beatles fan Paul McCartney has become. Yeah. Like yeah. He, he's, it's been enough time, right? That, I mean, he knows it was him and, and he, he's Paul McCartney. Like he, he definitely similar to what you said about Rick Rubin. He's humble and also very confident and cocky about what he has accomplished, uh, which is great that there's any humility there at all, <laughs> given, given how, what the, given the pedestal the world puts him on. But, uh, yeah. but he really is a Beatles fan. Like he was into the, he's like, these are good songs. Like, you know, it's like, wow. Yep. There it is. Yeah. That was a, what was that? McCartney three, two, one, I think was, that's uh, it. That's yeah, it. Yeah. I, I like that. Worth a lot. another watch. Yeah. That, that was during the COVID, right? I, I, yeah, I watched it during COVID. I, I, I presume they filmed it during COVID lockdowns. Yeah. 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 That, that was, I can go good. back and watch that. Same. I know. Yeah. It was, uh. Yeah, that was good. It, it's it's nice that we get these things for sure to happen. I, you know, I mean, McCartney's not going to be around forever. Um, of course, Keith Richards turned eighty this week, so he's celebrated mm. eight of his uh, twenty five decades, I guess now. So <laughs> amazing. Yeah. Hey. Um, yeah. We're auditioning a drummer next week. I'm kind of excited about it. Really? Huh. So that's cool. I, like, are yep, you auditioning so, many drummers? Are you holding a, an audition for several? For, are you auditioning for your drummer slot? And that's, well, or are you auditioning one drummer? It's a super interesting question. So we've gone out looking for a drummer. And we found a lot of really good guys who want to sub. Okay. They don't want to make, the, they don't want to make a commitment to the number of gigs we have. They want to be on our sub list, you know, I yeah. always talk about Vanderhul and how prepared he was. No idea whether other other guys will prepare to that level. Anyway, I want I want a guy who wants to be in my band, right? I get that. And yeah, yeah. And so we have we were prepared if we had to, to you know I've got about thirty gigs booked for next year, uh, to have a contingent of subs, pre booked, ready to go. You know, whatever part of our show they know, that's the part of the show that we would that we would play and you know, we would get through the year. It would be intensely on next year's our 25th anniversary. And I really wanted it to be a super special year. And it's a, you know, a, a lot of mixed feelings because for so long, it was such a tight knit group of guys all for one, one for all. And it's become very different. And it, you know, started becoming different when I announced that I was going to be moving away and we would be playing a little less. I sure. did not realize the impact that that would have the amount of change the amount that guys would go out and create other things for themselves. Like I was not prepared, but that said, you know, we're still here. We had a good year last year, changing drummers again. Uh, uh, we were about to audition a guy it, it, kind of interesting. He he's in another band that is a band, a friend of ours. He's a very good local drummer. And, you know, I, I'm the guy who will go talk to a, a band leader before I, you know, yeah. do something that's going to cause that guy an inconvenience. But this drummer said to me, Hey, yeah, I'm in that band, but you know, I take whatever is offered to me first. So that's interesting. Um, and we're, like I said, I'm already 30 gigs booked into 2024. That would be ready to be offered. But again, did you, did you check did, your schedule versus his schedule? Since he is someone who, who has explicitly said, I commit to whatever I'm offered first. And once I commit, that's it. Like is his availability compatible with what you guys have going on? We didn't get that far. And, and okay. it's, um, it, you know, it, you know, you know, the good cats in your, in your, mm -hmm. in your scene, you know, so I'm quite sure that he would be a, a very good drummer. 
whether he would click all the boxes. And again, he wasn't offering to be, he didn't say he wanted to be in our band. He said he was available to sub for us as he about anything else. And so I'm not exactly sure what technically that means that he's yeah. in another band, but he will take, take the first, you know, call that he'll get for anything. So I'm not, I'm not exactly sure what that would mean. And I wouldn't want that for, that's, that's not a guy who wants to be in my band. It's a guy who wants to sub in my opinion. Oh, I, that, I, that, I, I would agree with that. I, I would define he'd be it the good same to way. His word. No. Yeah. He'd be good to his word that if he, if yeah. he was booked, I don't, he wouldn't bail on it, but you know, that's a different thing. Anyway, we, there's another guy who has a really great reputation. I've known him, but I've never played with him. I've seen him play and he's going to come in and play. And he's interested in, uh, at this point in his career of having someone else do the bookings and, you know, plans, the size shows that we do and, you know, making some of the money we do. So it, it, we're, I'm excited about that. I wanted to share how I approach this, this, uh, this process of, and I'm saying auditioning, but I don't know if you remember, but years ago when, when Joe retired and I, and I thought that's what you do is auditioning. I was amazed. Do you remember how people got all bent out of shape at me using the word auditioning? I don't audition, right? It was, it was so weird to me that kind of first call level players for whatever reason with, with at, at the level of a local band thought the act of auditioning was insulting, right? It was, it was, I, I do remember that. I, I, you know, and, and I'm trying to, trying to contextualize that. Like I can see where someone who can play and, and has played around and, you know, has, has sort of proven their, their metal, right. It, that would feel like, well, you guys are playing, you know, GB songs just like everybody else. I like, I, I understand yeah. you're not, but, but like, I can see that mindset from the outside being, well, you're playing GB songs. Do we really need to audition? And, but I also understand it from your point where you don't want just someone that's capable. Cause if you did, you wouldn't need to audition them. You just give them a song that you, you'd go on reputation or what you've seen You'd give them a song list and they would come and sub for you, which you have done, right? You're totally okay not auditioning a sub, but you're looking to find a bandmate. And that's, I wonder if the word audition is the wrong, or it, it, I, I don't think it's the correct word to use for what you're looking to do. Well, I somewhat learned that lesson and I don't use that word now. And, and guys, <laughs> what word do you wh use? Whatever. Well, I say, do you want to come work out with us and let's see if there's a good fit? That's all I say. That's it. Yeah, because that's what you're looking for. It's like, of course, we, we're going to be able to play these songs together. But are yeah. we going to enjoy the hang? Are we going to, yeah, is it musically a fit? Yeah, that's, uh, yeah. and personality a fit. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So the songs that I gave the guy coming in, I gave him five specific songs and, and you know, asked him to prepare them. And, you know, I, I just... A, I'm, I'm interested in seeing how much work someone's willing to do um, and it's get good, an idea for the it's work. It's a good ethic. litmus test, yes. Yep. And so, for example, the of the five songs, um, one is um, uh, Uptown Funk, but a little bit slightly, you know, our, our arrangement. Your a little arrangement. bit different intro. Yep. 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 All right. But but still, as, as GB a song as there is right now, right? Yep. Uh, uh, one is harder rock and roll. Again, we take a lot of things off of live recording. So, you know, okay. Huey Lewis live at 25, again, different arrangement, kind of a specific ending. One, one of the songs is, um, September, cause got to see if you can play, you know, that type of funk as well. Cause we play so much of that it's different. Yep, and one of the right. songs is, is Rosalita by Springsteen. And it's funny because I, I always get eyebrows about that. Um, I did like a lot of guys who don't know Springsteen don't know that song, which is weird to me, but that's, I, I did. I but, remember the first time I heard of that song and it was at Macworld Expo and you were, I, we must've been in Boston because you were leaving a day before the show ended and you're like, yeah, I got a gig tomorrow night. So I'm flying home tonight and, uh, we're trying out Rosalita tomorrow night. And I was like, mm -hmm. and you, you said it like. It was, you know, we're we're trying out Honky Tonk Woman tomorrow night. It, as though it was a song that everyone by name would just know. And I was like, okay, you know, and, and we just kept talking. It was like, oh, this is a Springsteen song. I get it. Right. Of course. Okay. 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 Got it. You know, but yeah, I had, I had no, 
I, I did not know that song, uh, you know, until you mentioned it. Yep. Great so song, a, by the way. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate you saying that. Not everybody feels that way, if, especially if you're not a Springsteen fan, but it's specifically on the rehearsal list because it's a squirrely roadmap and you, you got to prepare. You got to learn it. You can't. It's like a prog rock song. That song. Yeah. No, yeah, it's, it, it, exactly. it's like Born to Run is the same way. Like the the form yeah. of that song does not follow honky tonk woman or you know form right. Like you've got to know the roadmap of that song, and if you if one person on stage doesn't, you're done. Like yeah, the, yeah. The song goes flat if a if someone fakes it, or b if someone can't really reach in and get the vibe. Because it's one of those songs that if everybody is selling it. It's a real happy song, bounces. It, you know, it's just a great summer song. Yep. But if someone's like, this is stupid, you know, nobody knows this song. Oh, if you get yeah. one drag anywhere that someone's phoning it in, the song feels very different because, again, not everybody knows it. And so yep. it requires a full band effort. But not, it, it, you're like, that, that's a great analogy. It's kind of like a prog rock song. There's a lot of parts to it. There's not an easy roadmap to it. It's got different feels in it from other things. It's got different grooves. And um, it, it, that's just a great, I think it's a great audition song because someone has to make a very conscious effort to mastering it. Yes. And it's, I, we had one guitar player who came in and he goes, yeah, I, I wasn't going to learn that for this audition. And I was like, Oh cool. Well, you're not going to get the gig for this. You know, <laughs> man, like, I'm literally going to come in and say that, that, that's more time than I'm willing to put in to see, you know, if, if I can play with you, I guess you just told me who you are and I was fine to say, yeah, that's probably not going to be a match. That's but, interesting. Um, the the bass player for Uptown Celebration, the, the guy who got the gig at the first audition, and there were probably 12 songs on the list. He's like, yeah, I've, I've worked on this one. This was born to run. He's like, I've worked on it, but I, I don't have it down. And it was like, it was fine. He was very respectful about, it, you know, everything. And, and so it worked out, but yeah, I can like that's it takes a lot to to learn one of those tunes if you don't know it already, obviously. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So uh the the guy said he's up for the challenge. You, you know, I asked him if he had any questions about the songs. And so we're gonna do it. No horns, just the rhythm section gonna get together. Yep. And we'll see if there's a the, there there. Like I said, I already have a plan B and that I have four great, you know, very competent subs, but maybe this will this will, you know, get us where we need to be. But that, actually, going back to your original question, it has been a very interesting thing uh, in my little pool of the world in the South Bay area of California. You know, we would have to kind of go out starting looking for a non-usual suspect. The usual suspects and the kind of working pro guys have not have not been interested. You know, even though, again, it's good shows, good crowds, good money. Subs want to be subs, I guess. I I guess maybe that's it, huh? Yeah, I I um, we've talked about this a lot over the years. That the idea of, you know, one of the things you and I both really like is being in a band, and a band of subs is not a band. It's I mean, it's a a you know, it's a playing unit, but it is not. It's not the same. Yeah. And yeah, yeah, I, I think I think the reason that our band has been successful, this is the thing that we've put on stage has been this emits this feeling, inviting feeling of unity that people makes people smile. I mean, the players are really into each other, and you know, the players, you know, it was it was it it, it was kind of a family feel. And again, the band is in a very different place right now. You know, we had this conversation about things change. and But they also change back is kind of an interesting thing. You can go through phases where, you know, guys are disconnected. But all it takes is like a couple people who had a couple of head, their head banging against the wall with a couple of their outside projects to remember what a good thing it is to have an ongoing, steady, stable, consistent group. And, you know, you're reminded, oh, yeah, this is like a comfortable glove. I, I remember why this is so fun for me. And that can change the vibe right back again, right? Yes. Yeah, that's the beauty of it is that comfortable glove feeling where it's like, oh, crap. Okay, we haven't played in a little bit. We're not going to get a rehearsal in. And yet we're going to go on stage and play like a band. I, yeah. You know, like that, that, that's not the optimal scenario, but that's a heck of a litmus test for, you know, are you in a band? 
or are you in a band of, uh, you know, a group of musicians? A collection, yeah. A collection, it's yeah. a very different thing. It is a very different. I, thing. I think, yeah. I think, you know, that, I don't know that one's right or one's wrong. No, no. But I do know that you know, if you think about, who, especially if you're a, cl a classic rock lover, the bands that you love, you know about those bands. You know about the conflicts they have in those bands. You, yeah. <laughs> you know, you're you're into the story of what makes them gel together and that that emits at least that type of music in a in a really powerful way so it i i i'm a band guy same same i'm a, i'm a band guy but i you know as we documented for the last 9 years i'm a super stubborn band guy who thinks i'm right all the time and thinks my vision is the only one that's really right and <laughs> i have to check, check i have to check myself to get along because i want other people to be in my band sure sure and yeah, I have, yeah. you know i've had to learn over the years that even if i do all the work um you know if you invite other people who are a band guys in they're gonna you know want some say and they're gonna want yeah. some input they're gonna want some you know connection that is makes it easy for them to express their art so it's that's been a lesson that's that's that whole conversation we've had over the years about about when a when a day job business guy starts a band, especially as a, you know one who's had any success and thinks they've figured the world out and that you know they know how to run something. Yep, that's that's a dangerous thing. I mean, maybe it gets it done, but I know in dealing with non day job business guys who are excellent musicians, it's a very different approach to creating harmony. You know, coalescing personalities. Yeah. Yeah. It takes, I don't know. It, it's, it, it doesn't always work. It has to just be the right personalities. I, I, I don't, yeah. I don't know. I'm trying to think if I've been in a band where the leader has been able to massage the personalities together that otherwise would not normally fit together. And I, I mean, well, I think the house rockers are that. Are they that? Yeah. I was going to say, I think you know, so. Fling might be that. R Russ is good at at massaging people together. Um, but bands are always, I, one of the things I love about bands and playing music in general, whether it's a, a you know, a band by our definition of, uh, in this episode or just a group of musicians getting together to play whatever, I, I love the diversity of it always, right? Like, you, you know, there's, the only thing that matters is, can you play? It, it doesn't matter, you know, where did you grow up? How did you study? You know, how much money do you have? Like all of those things sort of fall by the wayside as soon as you start playing the first note. Right. And, and, and mm. I, I love that, but, um, but yeah, I, I guess, I, yeah, you, and you think the house rockers are that you, you've, those people would not very different personalities, not, you know? Yeah, it, for sure. You know, there, there are guys who it, you know, and again, when I started, you know, the, all the horns were really used to horns being yeah, yeah. hired guns, right? It took me so many years to convince these guys they were in a band. And, you know, you can't just decide the day before a gig, you're going to send a sub because you got a chance to play jazz somewhere. Right, right, I mean, right. it took a long time, you know, and if Russ is good at that, that's, that's a superpower, man, because it's hard. Yeah. I mean, you know, getting people on the same page eliciting a common vision for people to work towards, you know, in, in uh, opening pathways of communication when some people are not good communicators and, you know, being able to be on the lookout for when people are withdrawing because they're not feeling heard or not feeling connected, you know, keeping a band together is hard. And, you know, for, like the Eagles, who would you say in the Eagles, who would you say in the Eagles, the band was most important to? Oh, I can't think who, what the answer to that would be. Wasn't Glenn? I mean, kind of. I think I I would say it was Glenn or Don. Y yeah, I think they were like it's it's our band. Like yes, yes, we're calling ourselves a band, but they were so strong personalities and you know kind of leaders. Yes, they needed they needed each other, but I'm not so sure that they that they needed the other guys to be in a oh, band I, with them. They I were, see what in you're, a band, but I see what you're saying. Okay. So yeah, the concept of the Eagles, I think is, is the, is the question I heard you ask. What I think you were asking is which member did the, the reality of the Eagles 
and and remaining a member of the Eagles, you know, to whom was that the most important thing? That's really interesting. I I would, I mean, I in that documentary, Timothy B. Schmidt and Joe Walsh both expressed their gratitude for being in that band. And I, I wonder if Joe Walsh is it because Joe could go and, and has like, he came in with that pedigree, right? He was Joe yeah. Walsh. Yeah. And so, but he chose to, to be in a band, to set that aside, to be in that band. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, I, I think, I think it, I think Joe might be it. Yeah. That he would be my, my answer to, to that question. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. So as, as we're going into this new year, you know, auditioning drummers, I'm booking gigs like crazy. I actually am very keenly and consciously trying to find my place where I can see I, I will look out to see how much being in the group means to people versus how much it's a job and a paycheck. Yep. And what the chemistry is in this next incarnation, given that we've gone through a lot of change. And, you know, I'm hoping to be pleasantly surprised. I'm going to kind of keep my mouth shut and just see what organically comes until I see that there's trouble, right? And, you know, I don't know what the bar for trouble is going to be. I was going to ask you what the bar for trouble is. Yeah. (laughs) Well, I mean, I think the bar for trouble is people who do things detrimental to the band, right? Okay. Yeah. So, you know, if someone cancels on gigs at the last minute or is, you know, trying to take take gigs away from the band for their own side projects or, you know, or, you know, is only being negative and not constructive anyway. That I mean, I, I think that's what the bar is. Someone okay. who's sure. acting in a way detrimental to the group, right? But, you know, and that's, you know, I'm not expecting any of that. It's possible, but... But whether people are into it like they used to be into it, I was saying a couple of weeks ago, I kind of mourn for those years when we were when we were building something, and um, it was really felt like ten guys pulling in the same direction. Which when it's ten, when it's three guys, it's powerful. Yes. When it's five guys, it's powerful. When it's ten guys, it's powerful. So so it'll be a very uh, interesting thing. We've got great gigs booked. We've got a lot of to look forward to. Again, good gigs, good crowds good pay and but that's essence, not enough good, is it like that that's well, we'll the see. well but th- but like you've already proven that at least to some people that's not enough to to hook them in to want to be in the band i i think you've got to find people who want to be in a band it, and it, it doesn't matter I mean, it does it matters to a degree like if the band's doing nothing well then there's no band to be in but even then, it's yeah. like, well, we're still in a band. Like, even though we're not playing, even though we're not doing anything, still band. Like, cool. Yeah. Like, like that. Those are the people you want. And you know, I was as as we were coming into this episode, I was thinking about all the things that we've done in the last almost nine years, right? Right. And one of the things that came to mind was when I flew out there in August of 2016 to play those yeah. gigs with you guys. And I mean, I don't take what I'm about to say the wrong way. I was welcomed by every single person with open arms. It was wonderful. However, it was very clear. It was palpable to me that I was filling in with a band and there was no, like there was no crack in the armor. There was like none of it. And usually as a sub, I will tell you when the armor has a crack in it, the sub is the first one to hear about it. You know, yeah. <laughs> well, because it's like, oh, finally, there's somebody that's like here that I can talk to that's not like brainwashed by the rest of, you know, whatever. Like, if I've, I've been there. That was, there was nothing of the sort. It was, uh, you know, a band and everybody was very thankful that I was there. And like I said, very welcoming. And I already knew Joe. And so, like, it, it was, it wasn't weird in any way, shape, or form. However, I was filling in with a, very, very tight knit band. That was the vibe I got in, in 2016. So that was what, seven years ago. Yeah. 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 I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, there's nothing in that to take wrong. I mean, that that's exactly the situation 
that I knew, but they all knew, you know, I've been talking about you and they yeah, yeah. of you. And yeah, so we were I mean, already that, doing this that was, that was show. So yeah, it was easy. And, uh, yeah. No, I think I had played I with think, you a couple times too. Like I had flown yeah, out prior yeah, yeah. to that for your birthday and, and had yep, filled yep, in. Yep. So I was a known quantity and, and not a threat. And you flew across and you flew across country to help us out. Correct. But, but not a threat. Like there was no, no. world where, well, if I was a local guy, even if it was all the same things and I happened to live next door to you instead of across the country from you, then there's like, then things sometimes get weird. It's like, well, we like the way this guy played. I don't, and there was none of that, but you know, like right. I've seen that happen where it's like the sub becomes the the primary member, you know, <laughs> it's like, yep. Yeah. And been, been there, done that. So, but there was yep. none of that because there was no risk of like, I'm, not, I'm definitely not going to relocate as good as your band is like, that's, that's not enough to drag me across the country. You know, <laughs> not that there was yeah, that yeah. offer, but you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Hey, so I, I wanted to add one last thing, you know, for this last episode we're going to do for a little while. And that was just kind of share. Well, I, just to be clear for anybody listening, gig gab will continue. Paul is, is, is going to be the, is going to be more occasional. Yes. yes. Just to just like, yes. we're all good. Yeah. Yep. Yep. This, this last one you and I are going to do certainly for this year. And you know, in, in this regular cadence that we've had yes. for so long. Oh yeah. No, there things are changing for sure. I just wanted to, in case somebody hadn't heard the last couple of episodes. Uh, I just Absolutely. Wanted to make sure. Yep. Yeah. So I'm definitely in a point in my life where being a musician is hard. You know, it's, it's, um, I'm sending out a lot of gig requests and getting ghosted a lot. And, you know, and also it's just, it's not that fun to be booking, you know, right now. And, and it just feels hard. And again, bands going through changes. I'm, I'm playing kind of in two areas. On one hand, I feel super blessed to be able to play in two geographic areas, but also can sometimes feel like a musician without a home. I don't, I'm not like putting all my effort into building something in one place or the other. And I was just thinking about all of the great conversations we've had over these years, like, you know, the the pre-show therapy that we give each other, the the notes we get from listeners that are super interesting, commenting on where we're going or hearing something that, you know, kind of like what we were talking before about producers. Sometimes our listeners hear something that is a thread that you and I weren't even paying attention yeah. to in a conversation. So I just think, again, musicians are cool. Musicians are whatever level you're at, where, you know, the pursuit of trying to create some beautiful art that is soothing to your soul that you hope someone else will enjoy. Certainly the next level, trying to make some money of it and upholding the value of it or to whatever level you want to get from it. I just have ultimate respect and appreciation that the journey of being an artist in any way, but certainly being a musician, amateur, semi-pro, pro, is I, I am just always in awe of how musicians more often than not, at least the ones that I gravitate to make decisions about their life that is in defense of the art that they're trying to make. And I just think that that's just a wonderful, wonderful thing mm. to just, you know, want to, want to express something, a lyric, a sound, a tone, you know, a, a, a visual performance, whatever it is. I just, as when music is hard for me and I'm not that motivated, that's always what kind of shines a light for me is just kind of seeing how dedicated people are in the pursuit of getting that lyric, that tone, that sound, that visual performance, right. And that's kind of what gets me out of funks at some time. So I'm just not for nothing. I'm a little bit of a funk right now, but if, if this is the last show I'm going to do with you for a couple of months, I just wanted to put out there that all of the input, all the conversations, all of the you know great interactions we've had with musicians who just care about getting it right, whatever that means to them, just yeah. care about about doing something cool has been some of the most rewarding, you know, uh, experiences. I'm not going to say professional because it's really you know it transcends. If you want to be a dad, you want to be a dad and get it right. If you want to be you know a business person and you want to do it ethically and and get it right, musicians seem to have a way to finding a way to let those priorities snap into place and chase those things. And I just think it's one of the great joys of my life is just seeing people who are truly musicians, again, regardless of what your skill level is, people who are just invested in, in finding a way to express themselves through music that it just has been so meaningful to me. So all these, all these shows, Dave, all these conversations have just been 
really a remarkable journey. And I just, I, I, I have a great debt of gratitude that you turned this kind of idea that I had into something that we could do. Our, our weekly check-in phone calls at Two Bros, turning it into some kind of super meaningful and fun thing that we could, you know, communicate out to the universe about. It's been a great ride and I'll look forward to coming back and touching base, but this has just been so much fun. I've learned so much. I've definitely gotten way, way more than I've given in these exchanges. And so just want to thank you and thank all the listeners. And uh, I know you're going to do great things and you're such an innovative thinker and you're, you're, you're such an experienced podcaster. You're just going to find all these ways to delight your listeners moving forward. It'll be an honor and a pleasure to jump in from time to time. Oh, and thank you for saying that. And and thank you for the idea uh, that, you know, this whole thing was, you called me and said, should we do a podcast? And I was like, uh, we could, uh, it, but like I have, and when you, when, or, you know, earlier this year, when you said, I, I think I need to, you know, call this year, the, the last year, et cetera, et cetera. I, you know, I obviously thought, well, is this the end of gig gab? And I thought, no, I really like doing a music podcast. And the reason the primary reason, there's a lot of reasons that I really like doing this, but the primary reason is it gives me a, a focus on music regularly. And there have been times in, in my life and in the last nine years when this has been certainly in any given week, my only opportunity to sort of take a step back from all the mayhem that's going on in my life with like all the businesses I have or the you know the my family stuff or whatever and sometimes even the bands that i'm in like it can be a little trying and it's like no nope, i get to go and just focus on music for you know an hour and a half just for the sake of focusing on music there's no other reason and that's why i decided no this isn't the end of gig gap like i this this must continue it's selfish i but you're right i also know that in order for this to continue, it needs to be informative and entertaining and all of the things. And and I hope that the plans that I have and the plans that sort of evolve uh, will do that for all of you. And you'll keep me posted, right? Feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We'll get there. But thank you to you for, for the idea and for nine years of doing this together. COVID especially. Like those mm. episodes we did for the, you know, whatever, year and a half, whatever, however long you want to call it, of COVID lockdowns, there were a lot of weeks where I wasn't even, like, I would walk into the studio to do this show and, like, shield my eyes from my drums as I walked past them because it was just too emotional to think Thanks about. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. But it was like, nope, I can, you know, my drums are right behind me, but I can do this show and, like, focus and we can talk about things. And it was really helpful i i you know to to no small degree so yeah thank you and i you know i was thinking about what we've done over the last nine years together and i think we've done a lot of things but i think one of the things the messages that keeps coming up is we made it clear that it's okay to be in the music business right we've, we've called mm. this gig gab the working musicians podcast well working implies business being paid. Right. And it's okay to hold your line on that. And I'm, yeah. I'm proud of the work that we've done in that regard. And I've turned down gigs because we've had conversations on this show. And it's like, you know, I'd love to do that gig, but man, like you're making money. You're not paying the artists a fair share. I, I, I got to say no, because otherwise am I, I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth here. If I'm doing this and getting on gig gab and, saying that people need to like hold the line. If I'm not walking the walk, well, what, you know, what, what am I actually doing yeah. here? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah I, like, it's been great. It really, it's been great. Yeah. It's been great. Yeah. But I don't know. I, I think that's one of the things I, there's a lot of things we've done that, that I think are important and helpful and fun, but that that's one of them that, you know, it's okay to be in the music business. I fully agree. I know. I know. I know. All right. Well, do we have anything, uh, anything else? Merry Christmas to you and your family. Merry Christmas to all the leaders out there, all the band leaders, all the musicians. Enjoy the holidays and get ready for a big year next year. It's going to be, uh, I'm looking forward to 2024. I think, I think Uptown celebration 
the function party band that that I've played in for the last whatever five years, six years. I think that band is done, unfortunately. Oh, yeah. I I think um, it there. COVID. I I I said that I thought COVID would have killed that band, and it turns out I think it did, because coming out of COVID, that band didn't didn't jump back into things. Gary, the the leader of the band had a bunch of other stuff going on. So he kind of delayed until a year ago, December of 22 to really try and pull things together. And I think everybody else got, you know, kind of found their new homes. And that's well, why we had, I, I can relate to that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that's why we had to find a new bass player. Um, and, but even like our singer and changing Swapping out singers in that band, certainly doable. Everybody's always replaceable, et cetera, et cetera. But that would require a lot of work to kind of re the, the show is sort of built around Marty, our, our male singer. We did bring in a new female singer, it, Steph, she and Marty worked well together, but it's a lot to change out both singers. We're, we're not the van band. Right. So, right. Um, so I think that band is, done at least for now i mean you know things always like you know how it is music it's like things always like five years from now it's like hey you want to play a gig yep all right great and then yep. play a gig yep. and then it's like hey we can uh it, what's everybody's schedule like well I got, I got some room all right let's uh, you know and then the machine starts going again so i like th there's no there's no f you going on with anybody in that band in fact it's the most positive i've ever seen that band and and then it was like yeah but nobody has time at the same time to actually do this. So like he was trying to book stuff out for the summer and people are like, no, I'm already booked. I'm already booked. I'm already booked. And, and he was like, guys, I, I don't think there's a there there. So, um, you know, we'll see where that goes. I get it. Yeah, I know I you get do. it. Well, yeah, we all do. I have, yeah. I have much empathy for that, for that band leader. Cause he's a good guy. I mean, you've he's always a, talked to him you yep. know, very well. Yep. And, uh, th that's, if he, if he can actually look as, uh, at the situation, you say, listen, there's only, there's a point at which the amount of effort for the amount of return needs to be held up to the light. And if, if you know, this group of people aren't into it, everybody has leverage in the conversation. He can yep. be like, well, I'm going to go find people who are into it. Or he can be like, you know what? I don't feel like putting the whole thing back together again. Right. And, you know, but I, I, I don't want to waste your time. And I don't want to waste my time. That I think that's a pretty healthy thing. Yeah. And I think for anybody, but Marty, our, our, who is our, our male singer, if it were anybody but Marty that were, if Marty were like ready to rock, I think Gary would put a band around him and could fairly easily without having to retool the entire show. But with Marty being the, one of the ones, and he's certainly not the only one that, you know, has just other bands that he's playing in and other things. It was like, yeah, no, I, like I, 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 that when, when I saw that happen, it was like, oh, this might be the end of this. Yeah. You know, and he and Gary did. He came back and he's like, look, I'm I'm willing to be the guitar player in this band, but somebody else needs to completely take over. And that band doesn't exist without Gary being, you know, certainly a co-leader at least. And it's just not going to happen. So it's like, all right. Yeah. Well, yep. Yep. Uh, you know what? You got to take a second to raise a glass and and mourn. And anytime a good band ceases to be, that's that's a sad thing. The world is a little bit less, even if people go off on other things. Yeah, yeah. It was a band that worked, you know, and and you know provided the musicians a good home and made people happy when they played music. You know, whatever scale that is, if that if something like that ceases to be, that's a sad thing. And it is. But when it's time, it's time, I guess. Yeah, it it is time. I when when I first got his his email, you know, and it's, it's just been in the last few days. I mean, it, the writing's been on the wall for a little bit, but you know, it was it was like Thursday or Friday or something that he was like, "Hey, unless somebody wants to completely take the reins and figure this out, you know." And there was a a subtext of, "And good luck with that," you know. Mm. <laughs> but uh, yeah, but you know, it it was like I I I need to not be the one to do this anymore. So I yeah, so thank you for saying that. Yeah, it's sad when something like that ends. I I never like. It endings as as you can tell the show is going to continue folks so yeah. <laughs> well, good segue but there this that's what, episode that's so will end this. yeah this episode will end so thanks for hanging out with us folks paul thank you for i mean you know it was not almost nine years i think we're going to have you back on for the ninth anniversary of of gig gab in on uh, february fun. 19th yep 
uh, but it's been a fun nine years doing this show. It's been a fun several decades being friends with each other. And of course that doesn't end. So like, there's no reason to say goodbye to that, but, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to the future of gig gab and I, but I'm also, you know, going to miss having this doing this together on, on a regular basis. So, you know, Dave, I think for tonight, it would, if you would do me the honor, if you would take the tagline over and say it, cause you're gonna have to say it from now on. I will, uh, I, I suppose that is I, someone other than you is going to have to say it. Mm. And it's often going to have to be me. So, folks, no matter what you're doing out there, please, please remember, always, always be performing. Nice. <laughs>